faces again. I have the distinct pleasure of getting to assist in bookending the day um, with you, but really um, the uh, four distinguished panelists behind me are um, the focus of the stars of this last segment of our agenda, so I promise not to stand too much between you and them because I'm certain you have a lot of questions to ask the funders. Um, but before I, I, I turn to uh, their comments and pose a few opening questions, you will have the opportunity to ask as many as you like as time permits. I wanted to just get a temperature of the room and hear from you a little bit. We've covered a lot of ground since 8.30 this morning. And I wondered if one or two of you just wants to, um, in sort of as we say, a popcorn fashion, pop up and just share one thing that you learned or heard from a colleague or a friend or in the big breakout sessions. Um, just give us a feel for um, what's been sticky for you today in terms of some of the content that we've shared over the, the last several hours. We have time for one or two or three. Great. Thank you, and the, I know the mics are roving, so please stand by so we can all hear you. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, what I've taken, um, our organization is very small, and I can understand that most of, to me, it seems like a lot of the things that's discussed today is more on a larger level of nonprofit organizations. But being that we are a small organization, that we can still apply some of the strategic planning. And me and my sister, we both been kind of discussing things that we're going to. We actually have a board meeting on Sunday, so we will definitely be taking a lot of the suggestions and ideals to our other board members uh, on Sunday. So thank you. Outstanding, great. Thank you for being the first to contribute. I'd love to. Keep the flow going. Just a couple more folks. Anything you learned, heard, or sort of made a note of yourself when I get back to the office, this is something I want to ruminate on more, think on, create an action plan around. Linda? I think my big takeaway the whole day has been about deep intentionality. I think to be very intentional about everything you're doing, but just don't take anything to talk about. So Linda's theme for the day is around deep intentionality. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Other thoughts? Great. We've got one back here in the back of the room. Um, Thanks, Garrett. Yeah. On the strength, on the strength base um, in your organization for your employees, being able to find those people with those particular qualities, they may have more than one, so they may be able to do more than one job. You know, so I, I like that. Great. Wonderful. That's a very actionable takeaway. Love it. It's time for a couple more. Great, Christy. really enjoyed the discussion on uh, purposely creating a culture of inquiry on a board or even a committee structure and uh, getting away from the standard agendas and encouraging people to ask the right questions and explore ideas. That's it. Great. Wonderful. Any others? Okay, well the floor will continue to be yours, just in a different way. I wanted to get a little of the flavor of what's been percolating and popping for you over the course of the day, um, but we'll flip the script a little bit and allow you, um, after a couple of opening questions with the funders panel, um, to ask any and all of the questions that you may have. So again, same ground rules, if you will, as this morning. I think if you want to, we'll definitely take questions from the floor, but if there's anything you'd rather just be a little bit anonymous about, please feel free to use the question cards at your table. Um, and we'll have the folks that are roving with the microphones that goes up from you so that we can manage that as well. Um, so great, so I am joined by um, a, a illustrious group of, of panelists and funders known to many of you. I was asking some of them as they arrived in the room today, how many of you do you have in the room? And um, So I know that uh, these spaces are not totally unknown to you, but what an amazing opportunity um, to get to hear from each of them about their grant making strategies and how they think about collaboration. I will go ahead and say that we had a conversation offline about what does collaboration really mean? This work gets thrown around in a lot of different ways. Um, so um, as you ask your questions, if you can, uh, tagging on to your point, Linda, be intentional about what types of collaboration you're referring to and, and, and uh, I've asked our panelists to do the same. So with that, we'll open with our beginning question and just have everyone, maybe Michelle, we can start with you if that's okay. Go down the line and um, share your name, the foundation that you're with, um, how long you've been grant making, have been a collaboration space, and anything else you may deem to be pertinent about that aspect of your work. Sure. Well, my name is Michelle Kay, and my title is Director of Client and Community Relations for CNC Bank. 
So basically what that means is, um, in the simplest of terms, everyone else at the bank makes the money and I get the distinct pleasure of giving it away. <laughs> easiest way to put it. Um, so the way that the PNC structure, PNC Foundation is structured is the, the Dayton market consists of 13 counties. So I fund all the sponsorships and all of our grants in 13 counties. There are 37 PNC markets across our footprint. So in the state of Ohio, we have seven. We have seven regional presidents and we have seven people like me. The reason that this is important is because all of our decisions in each of our markets are made locally up to a certain dollar amount. And that dollar amount is $50,000. From there, it goes to Pittsburgh. But all the decisions are made locally, which from, from some banking perspective, that's sort of an anomaly. Um, some people have to go to, you know, if it's a different bank, and it has to go to, to headquarters all the time, but we don't, we don't function that way. Um, we, are, um, we are autonomous in that way. We get, we get to make the, the decisions because we live here, we work here, we play here, we know the players in our, in our communities, and we can really assess what those needs are to, to really move the needle in our community. Hi, I'm Kathy Conitz. I am with CareSource. I'm the VP of the CareSource Foundation. And this is really fun for me because I think I maybe know half the room. <laughs> so I just sort of feel like I'm at a big favorite dinner party. <laughs> so, some of my favorites here, so that, that's great. Um, so I think most people um, hear about CareSource. Sometimes um, it's a little curious because I think a lot of people don't necessarily know what CareSource does. In a, in a nutshell, CareSource, our core business, is that we are helping the states that we're in um, coordinate healthcare benefits for the Medicaid consumer. So a majority of our almost two million members are moms and kids, most at some level of low to moderate poverty income level, so we know that demographic extremely well. Um, how many of you, how many of you do anything that maybe touches the healthcare system? All right, so you understand how fun this environment is that we're living in right now <laughs> as things change from day to day. So as we expanded into both Medicaid expansion and then certainly into um, the marketplace, and a little bit of Medicare Advantage. Um, that's a really fun space to be in right now. Um, of course, it's all on how you define fun. And, uh, but we're very excited about being able to expand our services. We do more than just pay insurance claims. CareSource is a almost $9 billion nonprofit. And our goal is to use those dollars extremely well to not just make sure people have access to health care in the broadest sense, but to actually help lift people up out of poverty through a number of um, programs and life services that we offer. Um, I came into the organization almost 12 years ago to start the foundation. Um, I've been in the automotive sector, technology, so the private sector, community relations, running foundations, and I will tell you there are very few of us um, that ever get to start something from scratch. We're usually tinkering with something that's been around for decades. And uh, for somebody with my overactive right brain, I couldn't think of something that would be uh, more thrilling than really creating a foundation that doesn't just do good things for the communities that we're in, but truly does line up our philanthropic investment with the needs of our consumers. So we've been nimble enough to change a little bit over the years, and I'll tie this up. But right now, um, right now we are funding uh, social determinants of health. So really understanding what are the holistic social issues that impact health in, in all ways. So hunger, homelessness, how stable, stable housing, family environment, education, economics. Um, and it's a very exciting time to be in that uh, space, as many of you know, because we work with so many of you and you're the ones really doing the heavy lifting and I will tell you it's funny sitting up here because honestly I have learned uh, so much from you um, over the years. So this will be fun for us today. I'm Karen Levin. I'm Executive Director of the Levin Family <coughs> Foundation and I'm also a trustee. My alter ego is with Propolis Projects and I call myself the pollinator to the pollinators. And 
the Levin Family Foundation does some of its own programs like Celebrating Life and Health. And we also take grants in. We, get, uh, we open up for grants every year and we fund other organizations. The propolis end of it is the one that does all the collaborating. Right now, I've been working on that for five years, and we are the only organization in the world that has a lease with the federal government to put in honeybees at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. <laughs> we're working with a genetic line of bee over there, and we're doing breeding programs, and there's over 800 acres, and we have permission to catch the wild bees and do the different things over there. We're about to put in 200 acres of white clover. We're buying the clover, right? Patterson is going to do the distribution of the seed and create more environment for pollinators to have food. Uh, we've worked in a lot of other areas, like we partner with Boonshoff Museum, and we uh, got them a observation hive. We partnered with Allwood. We've got work with observation hives there. We partner with you, uh, celebrating life and health. So we're really big into collaboration and partnerships, um, and I hope to be doing this a long time. I said to them, they will pull my cold, dead hands off the keyboard. <laughs> Have that passion for you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. And I am Ayana Marcus. I am a program officer with the Dayton Foundation. I might be a newer face to a lot of you. I've been there for a little over a year. And as you all know, the Dayton Foundation is a community foundation. We hold about 30, over 3,600 um, different funds. Um, but of those 3,600, only about 100 of those funds does the grants committee have at our discretion to make grants to the community? So I know sometimes people see, oh, the Dane Foundation gave away 43 million in grants. Well, only about one to two million <laughs> do we have uh, more control over. And um, so I'm just going to hit a little bit on some of the more collaborative aspects of our grant making process. Um, our information is online, and I believe a lot of you are familiar with that. Um, but just a couple of things. Um, Back in 2009, um, the foundation developed the Nonprofit Alliance Support Program, which you might have heard um, from your speaker with the Dayton Performing Arts Alliance that helped boost and get that going. Um, so one way that we're continuing to foster a culture of collaboration with nonprofits is to incorporate that not just as a one-time initiative, because it originally started because of the, you know, the economics of the region and really trying to help nonprofits continue the service that they do. We've actually rolled that program into our discretionary grants process. So one of the types of projects that we um, do fund are capacity building grants and specifically grants that look at supporting um, potential mergers of nonprofits or in that type of collaboration. Um, so that's become a part of what we normally do. Um, in addition, um, something that I, I think more, um, we would love more of our grantees to take advantage of is our collaboration with you. You know, we do, uh, for our discretionary grants process, um, people first have to submit a letter of intent and then get invited for a full application. We welcome our grantees to give us a call, um, and really Michelle Brown is the program officer for that. Um, let us know about your project in advance of the LOI. Um, we're more than happy to give you feedback, make sure you're on the right path. And also within our grants making process, we partner with our donors. Uh, there are a select group of donors who um, we call our partners in giving and they are able to look at some of the LOIs we receive as well as the applications to see if they would like to fund that project either completely or um, add to what the Grants Committee has already um, decided to, to adopt and to fund. And so uh, those are just a couple of things just wanted to point out in regard to um, how we've been continuing to foster collaboration. Um, and one particular fund that I am uh, the program officer over is the Del Mar Social Innovation Award. And that um, is an award, the LOIC January 12th, <laughs> FYI, and um, that is an award that um, it provides up to $100,000 to one or more nonprofits 
who serve um, older adults ages 55 and over. And that actually started between a strategic partnership between the Dayton Foundation, a donor that just wanted to open up a charitable checking account with us, and a listening tour that we did with um, local nonprofits that serve older adults. And it evolved from responsive grant making to the Social Innovation Award. And we've also added um, an Encore initiative, which places um, highly talented retired adults in um, nonprofits to help them solve some of the region's most pressing issues. So I just wanted to, to get that layout. And definitely glad to be here. Welcome. Any other questions? Great. So I think just as one more sort of bridging question before we sort of open up the floor, um, and we'll see again where organically you all would like to take this conversation. We've already started segueing a little bit into this conversation, but if each of the grant makers could talk a little bit about a specific collaboration project that you fund, and I think uh, you led the way. Um, so maybe again, we could start down either Kathy with you or, or, or Michelle um, or Karen. Just share one of the, the things that you've been funding recently in that collaboration space and, and offer a little bit of reflection about sort of why uh, that was a strategic priority. Okay, well, since you're looking right at me, I will. I will <laughs> um, so one of the things that's been really fun for me in this role is that we continue ex to expand the footprint of CareSource, which ultimately then expands the footprint of the foundation. So uh, uh, we have expanded to, we're funding now in all 88 counties in Ohio. Um, and this year we actually started a second foundation, the CareSource Marketing Group Foundation, that allows us now to fund in our new markets of Indiana, Kentucky, and Georgia. So um, I have to say, when I started, we were in 15 counties in Ohio. I did a pretty good job of understanding what was going on and who was who in those 15 counties. And then we went to 36 and then to 88. And um, that was a challenge, but an exciting one. Um, and now trying to understand what the heck is going on in Georgia, quite frankly, I mean, I am enjoying it a lot. Um, but um, one of the things that I think is most thrilling about doing this is the fact that it allows us to expand our circle of potential partners around the things that we're really focused on. Um, and I will say, right now we are really focused on um, um, addiction, mental health, opioid issues. We are focused on um, healthy birth outcomes. That's a big one. Um, and by the way, that's the term that apparently the world is starting to use now instead of infant mortality, which just really, and most of you are shaking your head like, yeah, I know that, Kathy, I knew that six months ago. Um, <laughs> Um, I'm, just, I'm just learning that, um, but that's something that we work with so many moms and kids that's been really important. And, um, and certainly around access to uh, nutritious food, produce, food insecurity, rural health. I mean, we work in so many rural areas, we've learned a lot about that. Um, so I, I will say, and this is the most recent, this was just a week ago, um, we actually invested a quarter of a million dollars into one of the biggest collaborations I've ever been a part of, um, Franklin County, which is uh, Columbus and Greater Columbus, an initiative called Celebrate One. Um, Celebrate One is their massive community effort to stem the tide of uh, uh, deaths of babies before age one that could have been preventable. So uh, about a year ago, we invested much less than that, about $80,000 into a 10-unit apartment building in Southside Columbus, the lowest income neighborhood in, in Franklin County, to run a pilot looking at if we would take pregnant moms who were in shelter or on the verge of losing stabilized housing who are pregnant. If we can get them into safe, stable housing and then wrap the heck out of them with the services that we know they need, and everybody is, is, is different. Um, and many of these moms have had other children. Half of them were born premature. Um, so if we are able to do this, does this in fact work? So since last October, when we brought mom number one in, and ultimately, as of last month, we have our 10th our, uh, our mom. During that time, we have, um, I say we, have given birth to 10 
full weight, full term healthy babies. So we're thrilled about that. Um, and that was in this collaborative looking at healthy birth outcomes. They sort of did an aha and said, we need to make sure that we're looking very strategically at how that works. And so this collaborative that I will tell you has about, um, gosh, I'm going to say about 24 partners um, banded together and said, based on what CareSource did with that one apartment building, let's next year say we're going to do that for 100 moms. So that was our goal, to come together. And as of last week, it is a done deal. It will be scattered site, but we will have 100 <coughs> pregnant moms who are living in very vulnerable, vulnerable situations uh, participating in this program. And uh, we can't wait to give birth to those babies. <laughs> about our firm called Passport to Kindergarten. Um, Mark knows, Mark Meister knows about Passport to Kindergarten. We've been working with Boonshoft now for seven years, I believe. Um, he is one of five partners. Boonshoft is one of five. Um, Passport to Kindergarten works with um, early childhood education. We, when we speak of early childhood, we need zero to five. So not that we don't care about third grade reading or eighth grade math, but we really focus in on the little ones. Um, we look at that, this came about 10 years ago. Um, within, within PNC, they call it, they're at the top of the house, call it rural grade. And the reason that we focus in so much on early childhood education is because if you can instill in these little kids yeah. that school is fun, school is good, you've got a chance, this is, this is a super way to start building a, a strong workforce in the community. And when businesses come into the community, what do they look for? They look for a strong, educated workforce. Right now, we're struggling with that in Dayton, Ohio. I can't tell you, we just held an economic forecast luncheon, and three quarters of the room raised their hands and says, we don't, we don't have enough workers to fill our jobs. So from a business community, yes, it, it is a little bit self-serving because we want educated, an, an educated workforce, but Passport to Kindergarten works with um, low to moderate income children. Uh, the teachers come to us, they have to actually apply to be a part of Passport. Um, and they sign a big old MOU that says it's about a month's worth of education in the summertime, all week, every day. And there's, it's like no joke, you have to come if you miss a day, you're out and the next teacher comes in because we have a wait list. Um, so it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty fun. Um, and the kids get, you know, we work with them, we, we do food, food drives for them, we do hats and mittens drives. Each one of our PNC employees is given 40 hours, 40 hours per year to work in the schools within our Grow Great program. So we are a little specific on what they can do, but they can go in and read to kids. They can clean, pro, uh, clean playgrounds. They can cut hearts out for Valentine's Day. But they get 40 hours to do this. Um, so within, within our partnership, um, we work with Learn to Earn Dayton. We work with the Boonshock Museum. We work with the Dayton Art Institute. We work with uh, the News Machine. Um, we work with Five Rivers Metro Parks. All of these organizations work together to provide this program for three to 400 preschoolers on an annual basis. So within, within Dayton, since PNC's been here now for seven years, this is our seventh year of doing this, um, we, we do book drives for the kids. They get, they get books. They walk away with a, a stack of 10 books at the end of the year um, from Wires and Gardens with the children's, with the children's um, garden. So it's, it's pretty phenomenal. Um, we have moms who come back and say, this is my third baby who's been in a passport to kindergarten program. We're really excited about this. They want that. They want that attention. Because when you walk into a preschool class, and, and I, I don't have children, so I've not spent a lot of time in, but when I go in, I see, I see our volunteers in there, and they're sitting down with the kids on the floor. That teacher doesn't have time to do that with three kids in a small group. So by providing those volunteers, those, those children get one-on-one -on -one attention from that particular, that particular volunteer in a reading aspect. We teach our volunteers to read with the kids, not to them. We ask questions, we wait for their answers, we expand their vocabulary, and we do all this with the Dayton Metro Library. We get, we get books and we get training from the library. So it's kind of an expansive program, but from a collaboration perspective, we have organizations still coming to us and saying, can we please be a part of Passport? We just, we just don't have the capacity to do that. 
um, and neither do the teachers, but we're working on adding more into that because we want to expose these kids to places like the boom shop, like um, you know, the news machine, bringing them to the Dayton Art Institute. I mean, we bring them to the Art Institute on a Sunday afternoon. It's open to the public. We have 700 families and kids running through that museum. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, it's a riot to watch, it really is. They come in and they have a, um, they have a map and they're looking for a particular painting or a particular statue. When you <coughs> find that on the map, there's a docent there who talks with the kids about what they're seeing and what they're, what, what's going on and what's going on in the painting or what the, what the statue represents. So it's down at their level. It's not you know, from the docent art institute language. Um, and then after, after they go through the map, they go into the, into the Gothic cloister, which is the big area in the middle. And their art project that they were working on during the week is, ex is displayed in the art museum. So it's kind of special for the kids in the same way. So that's kind of my biggest collaborative effort. How many, how many school districts do you work with on that? Oh, gosh, most of our schools come from Dayton Public Schools, um, but we work with a lot of um, Head Start schools from okay. NBC, Miami Village Health Development Centers. Um, we have um, one in West, one or two in West Carrollton. We have some in North, um, North Dayton, North Ridge, I believe it is. Okay. Yeah. So, thank you. <laughs> very, very well put. So, I know um, Karen and Anna, we heard a little bit of some of your investments with respect to the, the white clover and the bee cultivation project and the social innovation awards. I didn't know if you wanted to double back and touch on either of those more deeply or add, add to that. One of the things that I'm really proud of, I'm in the process right now of doing a memorandum of understanding with Central State. Central State has hired a lady who is in entomology and genetics. And we're working to do sustainable beekeeping. Central State is an 1890 land grant status university. <coughs> and one of their missions is to teach sustainable farming. We also want to see sustainable beekeeping taught. The students there are African American, you have veterans, and you have women. And also getting away from the concept of monocrops, such as your soybeans and corn, so that you have more pollinator-friendly type of plantings going on, and we increase the amount of pollinators thereby ensuring our own health. <coughs> One of the big things that is, as I mentioned earlier, we have a queen yard over at Bright Patterson near Huffman Prairie. I always want to live there in a queen yard. <laughs> 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 well, we all, we all do. <laughs> These bees are very special bees. We got the permission to call them right be flyers. Oh. <laughs> and they are they are a line of bee called an Indiana Lake Chewer. And what makes them special is one of the things that's killing the honeybees is the varroa mite. These bees have the capacity to sense the pheromone of the varroa mite and they go and they kill the varroa mite. What we're doing is we're artificially inseminating queens. We have them. We're not doing any genetic manipulation. It's nothing like that at all. But we're taking these queens and they're living very happily and prosperously over in this area. And the drones they produce are haploid. It means they have the same genetics as their mother. So they go out and they mate with the wild queens and pass this genetic characteristics, hopefully, to the wild population. So it will also involve some research with Central State looking at the genetics of the bees over there. <clears throat> we have agreements with Ohio State and we also work with Purdue and certain breeding organizations. And <coughs> this could be really revolutionary. I, if I had my way, I would get more people involved. Just had a breakthrough yesterday. I had the Girl Scouts call me up. We're talking about creating some kind of a badge for pollinators <coughs> where I don't want to turn these girls into honeybee keepers. 
I want to turn them into singular beekeepers where they build the singular bee houses so that all pollinators will be given a chance at survival. Spectacular, thank you. I think those university partnerships are something of great interest probably to several people in this room. Um, I don't know if you had anything else you wanted to double back on. Um, well, I guess I can just provide an example of one of our latest um, social innovation award um, grantees and you know how it relates to um, you know us continuing to encourage nonprofits to think about partnerships that they may not have previously thought about. So for this past grant cycle, we received um, a letter of intent from the library to um, take um, interviews from seniors and uh, low-income homes, and also all around um, the Miami Valley as well. Um, and to, they're going to partner with WISO to just capture their stories um, because not a lot of people in Dayton really, um, you know, maybe fully understand, you know, the vast, you know, history and um, the different experiences of, you know, all the different types of people here and in addition, you know, the different neighborhoods and things like that. Yes, we know some of the, the bigger stories, but some of the smaller stories are people who have grown up you know, in certain neighborhoods and I've seen, you know, the different changes throughout the region. So um, they applied saying that they wanted to do that program and partner with WISO to do it and WISO would, of course, air those stories and store them in the Library of Congress. We also received a letter of intent from Rebuilding Together Dayton saying that they wanted to go into the homes of seniors and help them, um, you know, install fix-it kits to help them with different, um, you know, needs that they couldn't really do for themselves around the house and partner with WISO <laughs> to capture some of their stories and, you know, of course, have it, you know, aired. And we said, hey, why don't you all consider, you know, submitting a joint application? You know, and of course, they're initially thinking, I think this is okay to say, like, we're, we're very different organizations. Like, how is this going to work? But they, and we didn't force it. That's another thing. We can suggest things, you know, we can't force people to partner, but we just said, hey, here are two similar applications. It, can you all find a way to potentially, um, you know, work together on this? And they were. And I'm not sure how many of you are aware of their Senior Voices program, but they were able to combine their forces. And um, so again, um, the libraries using their expertise to help, uh, again, get the information out. Um, and they're soliciting volunteers to go out and um, capture the stories of these seniors. Um, we're, building to date, we're building together date and is going into the homes and installing the fix it kits and of course WISO is helping to to get the message out. So um, I think it's it's just was really a joy to um, you know watch these um, organizations really just t take that risk you know sit down have that conversation and come up with a really innovative program. And just to piggyback briefly on that, um, the donor of the Social Innovation Award through Delmar Healthcare Fund. Um, like I mentioned, they started with a charitable checking account with the Dayton Foundation, just wanting to open up a fund. And then they started with responsive grant making, just giving grants to, you know, organizations that serve older adults that maybe needed a bus. And then, you know, the donor came back and said, well, I want to do something bigger. How can we really, you know, change the conversation around older adults in the Dayton region? How can we do something more? And that's how the Social Innovation Award came about for the $100,000 award. And um, lo and behold, this past um, October was it, um, the donor, Don Ambrose, was given the um, Philanth or Innovator of the Year Award from Philanthropy Ohio for that work. Um, and like I mentioned, even doing the Encore program. So um, it's just it's great to continue to think outside the box and uh, see what ways we can continue to do bigger, better things. So I think it's obvious that to my right, your left, we have a pretty amazing array of champions and ambassadors for collaboration. I think, you know, Linda, to your point about intentionality being a theme for the day, we have this beautiful echo of um, funders supporting and, and playing that convener role and creating a space where nonprofits can come together, but this theme of sort of not forcing issues and, and letting um, organizations, creating spaces where organizations can naturally build partnerships is something that I'm really struck by and humbled by in, in each of your stories. Um, giving you enough, um, if you will, uh, you know, uh, meat on the bone to sink your teeth into, there's really some rich work that each of these groups is doing and each of these individual leaders is doing. Um, I thought I might see if this has piqued any questions for any of you, and I'm going to do a little nonverbal cue slash verbal cue with my panelists. I think we agree that sort of this is a wide open conversation, so you don't have to pinpoint your, your questions to, um, 
to collaboration questions per se. Is that a fair statement? Great. Great. So the floor is open. I know we have a mic on this side of the room. We may or may not have a mic on this side of the room. You just heard some amazing stories of supportive collaborations. What are your questions? Yeah. It's actually to the whole room. So I am Roxy and Channels, formerly known as Roxy. I'm AmeriCorps was a member at um, the <coughs> Richmond Center. And I've been going to a lot of conferences, meetings, meet with nonprofit organizations. And although all that everyone is doing is awesome, but my question is, where are our teens in this? Um, families of poverty, um, we got families of addiction. <laughs> well, the only program I've ever heard of going to these meetings, or that I know of, is the Big Sister, Big Brother program. And I'm just concerned where our teens are with this, because these families going through this, these mothers, these individuals going through uh, addiction, or, you know, have some challenges, these teens have a lot of trauma in that. And uh, so often I feel statement that these babies, as I look at them as babies, even though they think they know it all, because I have a 15, 16 year old, oh, they're a troubled child. Really, they're not. They need a safe place. They need to know that they have a voice in their body. Well, you Can put I it out to the room, but I think that's Roxy. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, th I think you're absolutely right. And you know, I'm going to challenge the thinking that, because um, I've been doing this for a long time. And I have to say, I am just a little weary. Not weary, but I'm a little weary of the comment, kids need a place to go. We've been talking about that for decades and decades. Um, and we often talk about that as being the solution. And I would really like to challenge the thinking, I know that's not what you're saying, but we hear that a lot. Um, <clears throat> we know that there are so many different components, not just for teens, I mean, starting with the babies, working with the preschoolers you're working with, working with all the way to the seniors that, that you're working with. Um, I don't know, I, I almost started to get up on my soapbox. Um, <laughs> I'm just gonna say, the people in this room can own the culture of your community as much as anyone. And, you know, right now we tend to look at our elected officials and our legislators as our guideposts for our thinking of what's going to happen. Because what are they going to do for us, to us? How can we fund it? You know, and, and what I'm loving seeing is, and I'm not really, this is not political. Um, but what I'm loving seeing is this groundswell of people in whatever fashion who are saying, we're not going to do this anymore. This isn't good enough anymore. Um, maybe some of it is political, because we're seeing people, you know, going, I don't like that, I'm going to run. Um, or people who are saying, you know what, we have a lot more capacity to do things that are important for human lives and not just doing things to people. So, sorry, I guess I am getting on my soapbox a little bit, but, um, so I'm just gonna end by saying my bet, even though I'm not providing any kind of solution, uh, but I think there are a lot of great things going on, and honestly, I think it is people and organizations and leaders like those who are here in the room, ultimately, the funders, we're not guiding things, we're just helping you, we're helping you accomplish your, your mission. I mean, I always say, without you, there is no, there is no us. So, you know, having this relationship between those who can help make good things happen and those like you in the room who are putting your, your time and your lives and your families and oftentimes your checkbook on the line to accomplish those missions every single day, we can't get exhausted right we, we can't we can't get exhausted I'm sorry I really I really am but 
So I guess that's my that's my message is you're right. Teens are in trouble. Um, not all of them, because you know what? A lot of them are leaders, and a lot of them are influencing their friends. So we got to find those, and we got to concentrate on some of those kids and make sure that they continue to be built up. Because honestly, I was a teenager too, and quite frankly, I wasn't influenced by, no offense, Shannon, I wasn't, in, I wasn't influenced by the YWCA. It was a great place. I loved it. No offense, Mark, I wasn't influenced by going to the museum, even though I, oh, sorry, Michelle. <laughs> discrediting getting the children involved and getting them out there and working and that to me was one of the biggest surprises I've seen recently in the newspaper and I wish something could be done about it because I use the kids from these youth works when we do gardens and things. Well, we have another question or comment here. Thanks for waiting for the mic. I'm with the New Shop Museum as well. And uh, one of my questions is restricted versus unrestricted grants and then funds for operations. And so the easiest example I have for this would be the bread and butter of the museum, as we've known it, as I grew up with it, has been field trips to the museum. Well, as we all know, the last couple decades, school districts have cut busing, which means kids no longer have access to the museum. So we've been able to, over the last few years, find funding to pay for maybe the buses to get the kids to the museum at a pass through funding, but not funds to cover the electricity bill or for the teacher's salary to educate the kids once they're at the museum. And so kind of as a broader question, I'm interested in your views on the restrictions of grants or on restrictions of grants. We have a, kind of sometimes a necessary evil for making sure that the funds get used for the right resources, especially when they're coming from um, corporate funds or shareholders. I was thinking about this just earlier today because this question always comes up. Does the PNC Foundation fund operations? And I'll be very frank with you, we do not. We do not fund things like electric bills. We don't fund things like salaries for teachers. Um, if you write a grant to me and three quarters of the dollars are going to fund someone's transportation to and from work or their benefits, that just doesn't really, that, that's not what we do. However, what we do do is if you have a program like you want, you need funding for transportation to get the kids there. We can take, we can, we can fund that. We can fund that piece of it for you. So the dollars that you're spending to get the kids to and from can go to your operations. We will fund those types of programs. But again, we, we just don't fund every day, keep the lights on type of thing. I know that's important to organizations. Um, we've looked at things like, um, you know, People wonder, you know, can you put your name on the scoreboard? No, we don't do that. However, we will fund a program within your school so that you can do whatever else you need to do. So if we're funding your your program to do whatever, you can take those dollars that you would normally have to fund to put towards your operations. I don't know if that answers your question or not, but that's how that's how we look at things. I know that's not how other organizations look at things. To so that point, does anyone else want to weigh in? Go ahead. I took. A, well, I'll just say really quickly, we're on very opposite ends of the spectrum on this. Um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna cut the banks and the power companies and the gas companies a break here and say we understand why oftentimes they don't fund operations because their dollars come from a different bucket. It's just the corporate. Uh, um, I encourage almost every grantee that are responsive grants, so 5, 10, 15, 
I encourage them at, actually to ask for operating dollars because we don't need to be married to a program because we're not using that as often those dollars are coming from marketing and advertising and that's part of the, the, the culture of, of other industries. Uh, and I have really gotten on my big wagon a lot over the last several years with our other corporate funders to say, you know, please, at least in a portion of your funding, quit being so married to programs and trust that our nonprofit partners know exactly where they need those dollars the most. Um, and sometimes that's an easier conversation than, than others. But I agree with you. I think we have got to quit being so married. We have discretionary funds, each one of the trustees. I have seen trustees fund operational things through their discretionary. It's not money that's voted on by the other trustees. So if somebody happens to know one of the trustees on our board and can get some money out of them, they have money. <laughs> right here. <laughs> can I ask a question to the group on that? How how many, I mean, how important is, I know that there are certain types of organizations that that's more important than, than others, but when you are having a conversation with a funder or you're writing a grant proposal, is it easier for you and ultimately more successful to go in with something that is a very specific program that gets them excited versus sharing sort of the universe of what you do and the multiple components and why um, a, 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 a uh, contribution to the organization is equally or more important. Which is one. Yeah. Yeah. You said the second one. And actually, the other thing is funny that sometimes they've been doing a program and have like, well, what's next? What's the new shiny toy? And so then they want to divert funding from that and you have to come up with a whole new program. Mm -hmm. That's something that we're doing yeah. a lot recently. I'm sorry about that. So that is really unfair to you, I'm going to say. It's like it's, like it's a flavor of the week. It's like, yeah. well, they're not going to fund that. That's they're right. not going to fund it. They've come to that for two years, they're not going to do it. They're bored with it. So, so you have to come up with like, like what Amber's saying. If you're doing training, what is it that's going to get them excited? Because if I just come in and say, this is what we do, and we've done it for 35 years, and we're the experts, it's just not nothing. So the, the reason I originally brought that up, we actually moved to kind of a new model for 2018, where <laughs> This doesn't work for a lot of grants, obviously, but for a lot of our corporate funders to say, um, if you can give us X amount of dollars, we think we can do what we need to do with it. You can pick which of these 12 things you want to be highlighted for sure. These are the 12 things we would like to do throughout the year, and which of these is the best fit. So if it's educating kids, they might choose to be highlighted at that specific event. If it's somebody who's more trying to spend marketing dollars and they want to be highlighted at their gala, they can choose to be done with that. But rather than having to ask people to sponsor five different events throughout the year, we're saying, hey, here's the bulk of money that we need to accomplish educating 200,000 kids per year. And we would appreciate it in January. For the next 12 months, any of these events that you want to be highlighted at, we'd like to share this And it's been well received. It's just trying to work out how you grants process and make that whole thing work. Some of the challenges that there are a lot of organizations that quite frankly they don't really care if they have the spotlight. So going in first yeah. with here's the different things that we can spotlight you with, we're kind of going, no, I'd, I'd really much rather see the organization survive. Or no, we really want to do something around these and pollinators. It's what do you got. But. I'm going to take exception to what you said. Um, I don't think it's that organizations are asking, we'll, we'll fund you for two years, we'll help you get whatever program it is that you want to get up started to get it moving along the right path. But at the end of two or three years, we're going to look at that and say, all right, you're now up and running. Who else have you gotten involved with that? And what else do you want to do? Where else do you want to be? It's not the shiny new toy, and it's not that we're not still interested in that program. It's we want to help you grow and serve more people and do more things in the community. It's not, and that, I, I really need to take exception to that. And if I may weigh in, and I'll, I'll hold it, um, and I'll get back to you if I may, but um, I, uh, ha, I lost my train of thought. Why don't you go ahead? <laughs> <laughs> I have some resources to share. I'll share them in a minute. <laughs> you know, I was just going to uh, piggyback off of that. The Dane Foundation, their discretionary grants, they don't fund operating either. But trust me, I, I did development, and so I wish, I'm like, I would give away all the money if I could. But, um, and that's because our budget is so limited. But sometimes what the Dayton Foundation does, because of 
the credibility that comes with being funded by the foundation, organizations are then able to go and leverage more funding. Mm -hmm. So we try to do that. We also um, blast our grantees on our social media, different things like that, so other people can see and maybe want to donate to. Um, and I think really, and I've heard a lot of this now, even from um, just that's that's the talk today, like, and even guys are you know getting away from like you know, thinking operations is just evil, and really changing the conversation too with our donors, because we are very much donor driven. So I think it's about continuing to have that conversation, um, and also with our development team, that when they go out with people and they want to establish a fund at the big foundation, you know, maybe they can talk to them more about, um, not so that they don't do this, but you know, ways to just, you know, let the Dane Foundation, or just being more just, Open with their fund, with their fund, and not saying putting so many restrictions on it, but saying, hey, you know, operations are a key to actually achieving the outcomes that you want to see for the Dayton community. You know, why don't you consider, you know, being more open with that? So I think that's also a part of it. Thank you. I'm, your check is in the mail because I've covered my thoughts. Okay. Um, kudos to Brady Ware and also to Kara for putting together a really balanced panel because I think what you heard here is four different answers, maybe some overlap, but slightly nuanced different answers, that really represents the fact that not every funder is the same, and that it really does, and as much as this may sound reductive um, in some ways, it really does come down to those relationships and those drivers that motivate giving for each different kind of entity and each different kind of leader. Um, I know you mentioned GuideStar, and this may be a well-known resource to many of you in this room, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention the overhead myth, the letter they put together several years back with BBB Wise Giving Alliance, and Charity Navigator to help explain some of these issues and help stage conversations between grantees and funders. Um, there's also an article in Stanford Social Innovation Review I mentioned to you um, called the Nonprofit Starvation Cycle. So if you're looking for ways to have these conversations with your board or with your partners or your donors or your funders or to think about this in another way, um, there's some nice uh, resources that have been dialogue in the sector as well. What was that? What starvation cycle? Nonprofit Starvation oh. Cycle, and it's in the Stanford Social Innovation Review. So this hand first, and then this hand. Sorry. Oh, I found it. You sure? <laughs> um, question for you that's probably going to feel a little political, but it really is not. Keep that in mind. <laughs> so with such a robust market going on because of our illustrious President Trump, um, do we as nonprofits, will we be able to see that robust market, especially for Data Foundation, where there's a return on investment, that we haven't seen in a long time. Will there be more money loosened up within 18 and 19? And or are you all not affected by that because of the way that you fund in a certain maintenance type of way? That, yeah, that's a great question. Um, to a certain extent, the, our grants committee has formulated um, some of the guidelines for our spending that don't necessarily always go, you know, with with the market in regards to, for example, with operations and things like that. But sometimes you do have a larger part of money to give away. Um, I will say though that there are some um, organizations that, um, for example, the Engineering and Science Foundation of Dayton. They um, are component fund of the Dayton Foundation. There's also the Dayton Public Schools Foundation, different things like that. Um, but for example, when when these other organizations um, who do give some grants to the community, as their funds go up, and because we give away a certain percentage every year, there will, should be more, you know, wiggle room for us to give out, you know, for them to give out more money to the community. And I do know that how we make those decisions when we do have more in the budget, we tend to go ahead and grant that out versus holding on to it, you know, and preserving it. Um, so you, you may see some. Um, I, I can at this time say if it's going to be more significant than it has, you know, in the past with the market going up and down. But um, as far as changing our policies, I'm not sure about that in regard to like what we choose to fund if we have extra money. But our, you know, we tend to if we have extra money, continue to give in the way that we've been giving and not to hold the extra. Okay. I don't know if anyone wants to follow on to that before we move to the next. Okay. So I mean, it's really more of a private family community foundation funding model. I mean, corporate foundations typically are are funded as um, a line item in the budget each year. So, not to delay the point, Kathy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but often, often, 
you know, foundations are usually connected with companies and there's usually investment, usually from an arm that is allowed to make that profit and then it gets switched over so that ultimately you can spill off some of that profit so that there can be balance within the nonprofit world versus in our nonprofit world for those of us who are social agencies that are a bit smaller. So I would think that um, part of care source and on the of foundation functions or a banking market that the industry would be equally as dynamic as what we're seeing in the investment world today. And I just can't, I'm just, the assumption I would make is that that money would have to be spit off. Oh, it is really, for, for us, yeah. uh, it is really much more connected to what's happening on the healthcare landscape, what reimbursements look like, yeah. whether the ACA is still in place, <laughs> whether it's all of the things that line yeah, up with that. So it really, our, our funding yeah. is much more lined up with industry. what's happening yeah. at the state and federal response level than the market. Carrie had something, and then if your comments are on the same vein, we'll go here. I haven't forgotten about you. Um, first of all, yes, we're making money. However, we did a bad, bad thing, and we have tax credits. And so to do our fiduciary responsibility, we have to unload those tax credits so we're giving out less money. We're not mad at anyone or anything, but in order to keep the corpus of the foundation at the level it should be, the trustees voted not to give out a lot of money this year. We will probably have tax credits next year. And, you know, it was, <laughs> it was nothing I planned on or anything, but we changed some of the leadership on our board. We now have Al Leland on our board. And Al is a task master. And, you know, he really looks at those numbers and everything. So he's one of them that has been guiding us in, in the way we're spending some of the money. Sure. So it's not that we don't like you, it's just that we've never had a credit. And Shannon, you know, I would love to say that as PNC is making money, that we would get more money in our budget. Mm -hmm. In the six years that I've been with PNC, I have remained flat. Yeah. And what I tell my committee is flat is the new up. You just be happy that it didn't get taken away. And we're really happy with that. So, yeah. Great candor. Thank you for your specific responses. I'm going to make the assumption these comments are pertaining to the same. Yep. Okay. Just an observation. <clears throat> we work with a lot of community-based foundations, like the Dayton Foundation. And, and I know no one's probably going to like this answer. But if you look at the OMIPA regulations about making prudent investment decisions. Uh, really what it, what it implies about being prudent and responsible from a fiduciary standpoint is it, not only how we spend the dollars today, but how do we accumulate those dollars? Uh, what's our investment policy? What's our growth policy? So that those funds, because the goal here is for those endowments to maintain and grow in perpetuity. So, so respectfully, you know, I, I, I would acknowledge that, um, you know, the market rebounds this year, and, and my Brady, our colleagues know this, we're, we're seeing unrealized gains and appreciation and investment assets that we've not seen before, uh, or at least for a long time. I know I sit on a board where at the end of the third quarter this year, was the first time since the crash where the fair value of our investments exceeded what we originally had invested 15 years ago. So, so the concept here, I think, is, or the, or the disconnect, is the market is skyrocketing. And yes, and that.
you know, so if you are a board member of that foundation, I would tell you under the AMIFA regulation, I would question whether you're being prudent if you sit there and say, hey, we had a huge gain this year, so our spending policy is 5%, but you know what, the market is good, let's give away 20 You know, that's a willy-nilly kind of approach, if you will, uh, and I think the board of the foundation would not be doing their job. Now, conversely, I happen to agree with you that some of our funders are, are a little too programmatic focused, because at the end of the day, if you don't have an overhead, how do you carry out a program? I mean, everybody here in the room knows that. You know, so I think there should be a little bit more consideration from some of the funders, but, but out of respect to our representative from C and C, if it's a corporate foundation, the shareholders of the corporation set the strategy. And you can't really hold them, I don't think it's fair to hold them to the same kind of yardstick that you would a Dayton Foundation or a community foundation who is really managing the community's money and making these investments as a whole. Uh, if they only want to pro uh, fund programmatic outcomes, uh, hopefully go to a more uh, community-based foundation, maybe you might get some luck in getting some operating dollars. Really and always remember, at some point in time, the market is going to correct itself. Always keep that in the back of your mind. Yeah, one last thing I'll say is that, um, and just to make sure I was clear, when, when because the Dane Foundation, for example, all these groups, like I mentioned, that have funds with us, they give out, you know, 4% of their balance each year. And there happens to be a higher balance, they're still continue, you know, to give out that 4%, and you might see more grant dollars going out. But um, like you mentioned, trying to be fiscally conservative for the future, the Dane Foundation, we um, previously based um, our percentage off of a 12 rolling quarter balance, but now we moved that back to a 16 quarter rolling balance. So you may not see from year to year, but you know, the long haul you might see some you know, increases there. Great insights. Linda, I have you, and then you can catch your name, Shannon, and then I've got your hands. Wonderful. I was just going to say, as, as a person that is um, has applied for many grants over the years, from all of you, <laughs> um, and to know how difficult it is to write a grant, I just wanted to recognize and say kudos to the Dayton Foundation for the Dreamlight projects because that made life a little easier. Um, and we just received one of those Dreamlights that helped us go to an electronic health record and everything. And it, you know, it wasn't a lot of money, but I didn't have to wait six months. It comes out quarterly. It was a, a more simplified application and um, not to sound like a suck up because I don't mean to, but thank you for that. And who's ever idea that was? So that's mine. But <laughs> <laughs> I'll pass it on. That's called the Green Light Grants. And green Light Grants. Very good. Okay, Shannon. Um, my, I'm with Choices. I'm the finance director at Choices. And um, historically, we have only applied for grants and funding, kind of like the PNC model. I'm going to fund my operations through the way I've always have, and all these extra things I'm going to ask for grants for because so many places don't fund operations. And as a CPA, I don't want my grants funded, my operations funded by grants, because what if that grant goes away next year? then I have to lay off people or I have to not have the lights on or have running water in the building. So I guess this question is more for Kathy. If you are willing to fund operations, what is like the life cycle of that? What is the sustainability of that? If, say, I were to apply for a grant to fund my operations, is it an annual renewal thing? Or do you see a lot of where it's only for a limited time and then you're on your own? Or what does that look like? Well, I'm going to say something that everyone in the room is probably going to go, you know, duh. Um, but I mean, there are no guarantees in this in this world. And I appreciate I appreciate what you're saying. And um, you know, I think it's part of the reason why these partnerships are so important that we're having those conversations. And again, my apologies that there is not a universal grant process. Because I know what that means to have to understand every single funder and all their nuance and their life cycle and their, you know, does Kathy like a phone call? Would she rather have an email? Does she want a glass of wine? You know? If I buy her the whole bottle, I'm going to 
But I think um, I think your question does not have a flat answer. Fair enough. And it really, I, and I know it's tough, but honestly, it's something that I know that each one of you are having to figure out for your own organization. <coughs> and I always say, just like in the corporate world, you know, I tell our younger employees. You know, last year, we had a tough year. I'm surprised that my numbers were flat at the foundation. We had a really tough year at CareSource, and it wasn't our fault. It was reimbursement rates. It was the state screwed something up. I mean, we were $400 million that we were looking to make up for. So quite frankly, living in your shoes, trying to figure out how to help that line up and still provide services for $2 million low-income people who need you not to miss the pain. And so I, I get that that's really hard. And so as I say that, you know, your employees are like, oh my gosh, I can't believe so I'm not going to get my $1,000 bonus this year. And I use that to pay for my kid's private school. And it's just like, never count on a bonus. Never count on a grant. You know, somehow we have to figure that out. And I know that doesn't make it tough. but. But don't think that it's not tough on our end as well when we have to make those hard decisions about are we going to. Which is why I've never done it for operations because I don't want to be the one that has to say, I'm sorry that you're laid off because that grant didn't get renewed. Mm -hmm. or, and it's hard, it's hard on our side not to renew a grant, not to renew a sponsorship. We have really, really hard discussions on that. And you know, sometimes they're not fun. When our committee walks in the room, I mean, we take all of our little VP and senior VP and president hats off. Everybody has one vote. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't go the way, it doesn't go the way. It's it's hard. And at the end of the day, we're all in the same boat. We all have to be really resourceful with what we have, right? So that's what that, that's what connects so many of us. You know, first connection is our passion for who we are serving. I mean, I don't even fund bees, but I love bees. <laughs> Starbucks and just have a conversation. Sure, and two hours later, we were still talking about beans. <laughs> and I think we actually moved from Starbucks down to Graders because we decided yeah. we had enough coffee. Yeah. 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 Um, but you know, I think that, you know, how many people, how many funders are out there? Because I mean, you can't do this in a vacuum. How many funders are out there that that's what they're funding is saving the beans? I mean, not very many. So you're on both sides of the <laughs> Just the most humbling experience that I had was Saturday night. I wrote a grant to Project Apis for $23,000, and I'm matching it out of my uh, trust, yeah, out of my discretionary fund. And I have no idea whether or not I even have a chance. It's like taking Kierkegaard's leap of faith. You go in there, you submit this thing, and you and your ego is involved, and you spend a lot of time on it. So I, I mean, I, I'm a lot nicer now. <laughs> very, very I think you heard it here that, that we feel your pain coming is truly from the heart. That there really are some resource decisions that we all share. I didn't catch your name, but I, I know you had your hand up. My name is Shelley Chappelle. And my organization is Mothers and Daughters United. My question Mothers is and what? Mothers and Daughters United. United. Okay. United. Okay. My question is, with so many organizations vying for grant money from you guys, and is there something that well I guess what I'm looking for is how do you how do smaller organizations match up to some of the larger organizations that you're used to funding year after year? Um, is it important to be like accredited through the BBB? Is there, you know, how do we um, stand up to some of the other organizations that are applying that have maybe been in business longer and uh, maybe you're, you're more uh, knowledgeable about? How do, how can we uh, become more visible? I guess I'm asking as a smaller organization, how can we become more visible in your eyes um, to find out about our program and what we do? I know Rossi has mentioned something about teens. <coughs> we work with mothers and teens, and um, well, our, our hardest uh, challenges are getting funding to have those type of programs so that we can continue to be viable in the community. So I just want to know how can smaller organizations um, be more represented in applying for uh, your grants? I guess I 
guess I'm going to go to, I mean, how many, in my park's quote system are all the time, there are what, 44,000 or 4,400, whatever that number is, nonprofits in our region. But we can't possibly know them all. Um, you've just now got a chance to, to meet four funders. Reach out. I, I mean, honestly, I've never heard of your organization. No one has ever contacted me, and not, not necessarily out on the street beating down doors to give away dollars. So if you, I mean, if you would like to chat with them, I'm happy to do that. Um, but it's more of a, it, let's have a conversation about that. And it's not necessarily competition big versus small. It really looks at who, who are you serving? What, what's your mission versus other organizations? Are you actually moving the needle in the, air, in the space that you're in? Um, to Kathy's point, we all have limited dollars. We want to work with the organizations that move the needle most and that really have a big impact. Well, I mean, it, it could be a small impact on a, on a big group of people, but we want to move the needle in our community. Okay. Thank you. The other thing is, a lot of times people come to me and they say, we would like to have the money to do this program. And I ask them, well, how do you know whether or not this program is going to be successful? So what kind of outcome measures are you keeping? Even though you're a small organization, you still need outcome measures. I had, last year, seven-year-olds from a school up north asked me for a grant to put in a pollinator garden. I sat down with those kids. They had outcome measures. <coughs> they had everything. And I, I gave their teacher the money so that they could do the pollinator garden. They submitted a report back to me. So, you know, no matter whether you're seven years old or whether you're 70 years old, you got to give the data. And I'll just tie that up by saying I think that's a piece of the broader conversation, and that is take the NPR approach and figure out how to tell your story. I mean, that's it. Look, I'm somebody that likes words. I take 100 words to say, you know, what other people would say 10. So, I mean, I love, I love words, I love conversations, but you know what, when it comes down to the, the, the funder grantee relationship and, and we don't know you, you find lots of smaller grassroots organizations, but it's figuring out how to tell me what you're going to do. The last thing we look at are the dollars. I mean, I purposely, on our, on our uh, proposal, it's one of the very last things we ask. So, how do you paint a picture of what happens with your organization? How are people's lives changed? How do, you know, whatever it is, but like this. And I will tell you a lot of newer, younger, smaller organizations just haven't learned that yet. So I find myself responding to an email five times going, all right, so how, how does this work? So what's the pipeline for getting those teens into your program? And do you have partners that you're working with on this? Because those are just the obvious questions to me. And then the answers come back and it's like, well, let me tell you about this um, wildflower garden that we're gonna put in the backyard. It's wonderful. Okay, well, do you know, who are your partners? And so some of it is just the story. The stories are great. And be, don't be humble. Right? Don't be humble about it. It's not the time to be humble about your story. Yeah. That would say, yeah, definitely to echo what they said. Um, feel free to give us a call. Specifically, Michelle Brown is the program officer. Um, her information's online. If you want to see me afterwards, she definitely highly encourages people to give her a call, shoot her an email. We're more than happy to, to talk. And I will tell you that there, there's an organization that I met with. I, I've met with them three or four times. Got the tour, walked through, sat down with the executive director, talked to the development person. I'm not kidding, three times. No one ever asked me for a dollar. Oh, okay, I'm, I'm here, I'm excited, and nothing. I, I mean, I just kept waiting. Like, ask for something. Think about why, if you want to meet, that's, I'm happy to come and visit. You, you've got to give me a reason. Why am I coming? It's great to see you and talk to you, but I need to know why. Great. Have the fervency of an evangelist. You go in there like you're the greatest thing in the world. I am serious. Like when I first started out this B project, I didn't know squat, but I sat down and I learned. And when I went out and I talked to people, I did not bend or anything. I went in there and I tried to do everything I could. And that's what you have to do is show them that you have this fervency and this a burning desire. This is your passion. Passion goes a long way. Yeah.
think there's a follow-up to that. Great, great, great. Very actionable advice. Yes. Yeah, we're both with the same organization, and we're both veterans, and we just held our fourth annual um, Woman of Honor luncheon for uh, female veterans, which we saw a need because a lot of times the women are forgotten as veterans. And so we had someone that um, raised quite a bit of money to um, pay for the active duty and veterans. They don't pay anything. They're, they don't pay anything for the lunch. And she went out and I mean, she hustled. She at, went to different businesses, asked for money to sponsor you know, that veteran or active duty. So you have to be innovative. You have to you know, have someone that's really willing and supports your, your cause and they'll go out and you know get the money or whatever they had to do and she paid for I mean, well, she raised money enough to pay for a lot of the women's um, fields so um, you just have to be creative um, it's a lot of homework and research and uh, it, you just have to have an open mind to try anything so that's what I just want to take you back on what other questions or comments do we have? I think we're getting some really, really honest and actionable perspectives up. I heard over here at the room, you know, that, that how do I draw attention to my program? Uh, and, and we're here talking about funding. <clears throat> I would, I, I've served on foundation boards. United Way gives up money, so I know how a funder operates. I know how to up if this is electric. Then it'll electrocute. I think when you're when, when you're applying for funds and you're looking at your program and you're looking at your grant application, and I'm saying this now from someone who's served on panels that review grants. The first question you should be asking yourself, the first series of questions, is what we're asking money for in our program. Who else in the region does the same exact thing? Question number two, if you can answer question one, number one, no one. Then the second question is, do we have the ability and the capacity, the vision, you know, the wherewithal, if you support us from a funding perspective, that we can bring outcomes to the community that nobody else can bring? Uh, and I would challenge you all, when you're sitting in your office or your boardroom, uh, and, and you all do tremendous work, but I'll bring us back to, to the start of our day. It, it was talking about how do we work together. And when you're filling out the grant application, most of you, I'm going to, please don't throw things at me, probably are looking at your budget, your mission, figuring out how do I get this money, and if you start that first question with who else in the community is doing this, then before you fill out the grant application, maybe you might want to consider talking to them. But because chances are they want the same money you do from the group up here, and, and four or five other organizations are going to want those dollars as well, maybe you pick up the phone and call and say, we can have coffee glass of wine because apparently uh, <laughs> I, I told him they could bribe me with Starbucks that, that would work but maybe you ought to go and spend a little time with your colleagues and say look you need the money we need the money they don't want to fund overhead so if we join together and carry this program out together well okay maybe it's overly simplistic but maybe now your overhead bird it's going to end up being half what you thought it was because <coughs> I have overhead funds to bring to the table you know and, and get out of your own boardroom um, every funder and, and whether anyone likes it or not every, every funder wants collaboration and it takes 50,000 different definitions and, and it's become a buzzword unfortunately mm. so the true meaning of it has been diluted incredibly yeah, but that's really what it is at the end of the day. I mean, I serve on the United Way Board, 
And if you come to me and say, I've got a program I want to carry out to take care of this particular targeted demographic, and oh, by the way, the YWCA is going to do our intake for us, and we have this organization here that's going to take care of our residential housing needs. Trust me, you are at the top of the list right there. But if you come in and say, I want my little piece, you know, I want it for my budget, and you aren't working with everyone else, uh, we are in an environment, like I said this morning, that funders just don't think that way. And, and it's not a bad thing, you know. They're just trying to make sure that their responsibilities, that we're getting the greatest impact, and I heard that this term several times up here, we're moving the needle. So, so please just don't lose sight of the fact that that $10,000 program might let you serve 10 people, but if we can figure out how to leverage and make it $100,000 and you impact 100 people by working together, I'm pretty sure these organizations are going to be more than willing to line up and write the checks. Because we're in an outcome-driven environment now. You're not being based on the ask and just because it's a small brand it shouldn't really matter. Every funder, I know United Way nationally is doing this, they're looking for outcomes. I want to know that the dollars I give you move the needle from point A to point B. And working together, I think you'll be a lot more successful at doing that, particularly if you're smaller. So I would encourage a smaller organization, you need to be identifying who your colleagues are. And please stop using the word competition. You are not competitors, you're colleagues. So you've got to change that about your culture. Yeah, you've got to get out of your boardroom and start working together. I'll get off my sofa. <laughs> <laughs> well, and can I just wrap that up by saying uh, I appreciate what you're saying and everything is right, but knowing this room um, and knowing so many of you, as I do, um, and quite frankly, having uh, other communities across the state of Ohio who I work with, can you hear me? Did I do it right? Yeah? Okay. Um, I will tell you, you do as good a job of doing that as any community across Ohio. I mean, this is one of the most impressive regions about understanding how to make connections, work in the relationship, um, looking at the website first to see what, you know, most people, I mean, you're really, really good at that. So, I mean, I just want to make sure that you hear that. And quite frankly, from a funder standpoint, we talk about that. We have the community roundtable. We meet every quarter. I'm also part of those in other areas, and I will tell you, there are some that they're like, oh my gosh, did you guys get this capital request? We have never done that in the 18, 17 years since we launched that. We've never had one quarterly meeting where there's been conversation about, okay, because this is a behind closed doors. How do we help each other? How do we inform our CEOs? How do we, I mean, so there's every opportunity to start doing this, and it's never happened once, because I will tell you, this, um, this community gets it. And I will tell you, on the other side, you've got funders who are rooting for you. You know, they're not there to talk about what you did wrong. They want to make sure to help you be successful. I mean, I'm really impressed by the majority of the funders in this town. And there's also the private um, foundation lunches. We get together about every other month, and we sit down and we go over things that we find are disturbing, and we try to find answers to things, and we exchange a lot of information during those meetings. So, and one thing I'm proud of is nobody in this community that are funders are in competition. Nobody tries to backstab or anything. We all work together. We even do challenge grants with each other. We do all kinds of things together. So it is a very tight-knit and, and well-run community. Well, we collaborate with each other, right? We, Kathy and I have done some things together. I, I was thinking about that, yeah. collaborated with yeah. 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 You know, things we can't fund completely. I'm like, hey, can you help me out a little bit? And <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, God, Michelle. 
And I and, 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 and I had a conversation with Karen, I don't know, earlier this week or late, late, late last week about some, you know, a program that we want to do and I need some help and she gave us some ideas and so we we all talk amongst each other, we collaborate with each other as well as asking you all to collaborate. So it's not one sided at all. Great. Uh, if you, if we don't have a mic for you, please speak up as loud as you can. I'm Jenny Wolf from Cider Residential Services. We provide residential homes for adults with ED, and we also have a program, um, adult day services program. How do I find the resources in our area, Cider County, Portsmouth area, um, like you love the ladies here in your Dayton area? How do I find these kind of resources in our area? From the PNC perspective, if you go out on PNC.com and you look, um, oh, I forget what the tab is at the top, but you can go down and you can look for the counties that you cover, and you will find the person who is in my position in that area. I do believe that's part of the Cincinnati market. Her name is Dale Cosma. She's right. She's right there. All of her contact information, phone numbers, emails, it's all right there. Do you have the AFP? Association of Fundraising Professionals, AFP, National. I will say your peers, your peers uh, can probably be your greatest, your greatest well, support. In the uh, I've been in with the agency for 16 years, and we're just very small, and um, we don't have a lot of resources. We don't have a grant writer, a grant writer, yeah. a four grant writer. Um, lots of them have different others. Part of it is, you know, it's all about relationships. So there really, I mean, unfortunately, I wish there was a book, but there is this thing called the internet that I will tell you <laughs> there is really good information out there. Um, and sorry, I'm not trying to at all just boil it down to the sort of one of the most obvious, but I mean, there are some good things there. And then you know, talk to whoever, some of the top fundraisers, and take them to coffee and have that conversation. I mean, don't you think? I mean, I mean, this committee. I, I think that, that there's a grant writing organization, a grant writing organization, and they do a lot of group trainings, and then the association. You do a lot of the community, and you can come and there, or just as And I think you want to wait a minute to um, sorry, Philanthropy Ohio just released like the list of all the community and private foundations. Um, and if, yeah, so you should be able to find that online, but I also have it to you know, but if it helps a listen. Yeah. I was just going to digress for a moment in regards to small um, nonprofit organizations. We, uh, I'm taking my score hat off to become a nonprofit and uh, have a very small uh, organization organization called the Community Empowerment Organization, and we help communities uh, build capacity. But we, we can only do that when we partner with another organization that's doing something within that community. And just recently, we got a, um, we partnered with Antioch College to do a restorative justice symposium. And we got a grant from the Yellow Springs Community Foundation. And um, they were really interested in, you know, how are you collaborating? How are you um, bringing these two entities, higher education and community, together? And one of the things that we found with the Restorative Justice Symposium is that we not only collaborated with each other, we went to different pockets in the community that could benefit from restorative justice. So we, we started out with just policing but then we looked at going into the school system. So we met with the superintendent. We met with the chief of police. We met with a, a group for racial relations. And um, they were major stakeholders, but we collaborated with the major stakeholders. And it just made for a profound weekend with uh, everybody bringing something to the table in that respect. Another really powerful example of not just collaboration, but building those relationships. I think we have time, seeing no hands, to get a word or a phrase of advice, sort of some parting words or of encouragement, maybe, from our panelists um, before we have to wrap up today. And yes, I am putting them on the spot a little bit, so I'm not going to call out anybody's name right off the bat. But um, if you wanted to either 
tie back to some advice you shared earlier that really just resonated with you or a word of encouragement to the room? Karen. I have a word of advice. Never believe your own PR. You're only as good as your last plan. Great. Well, now I'm depressed. <laughs> Today, I should say thrown around, but mentioned part of the relationship. I'm a people person. I, I like to talk to people. I mean, I'll talk to you in the grocery line. Um, so if you if if you want to get to know me and, and what we do and how we do things, let's let's get together. Let's have a conversation. Call me on the phone. Don't just randomly go out on the PNC website and throw something in there and hope it sticks. Because I'll be real honest with you, it isn't gonna. If I don't know you and your organization and what your program is, the likelihood that it gets funded is pretty much zero. I want to know who you are. I want to know what you're doing in the community. I want to, I want to, if I can't fund you, I'll give you an idea of who can. I'm going to help you get your dollars one way or another. And by the way, we will end up as friends later. That's just, <laughs> that's just the way I am. I'll just piggyback on that to say, also that is very much true. I work for a nonprofit where <laughs> Michelle, but she definitely does. Like she's very, very helpful. So thank you. Um, I'll just also piggyback on that to say, yeah, relationship is a key. One thing when I was in development that I wish I would have known or someone would have told me is that when grant makers are in the room discussing proposals, it's not just what's on that proposal. They talk about, I mean, things that may have come up in conversation, history, leadership. There's a lot of other things that go into it. Not saying the proposal isn't important, but those things are a factor. Um, so just, again, building that relationship, especially I sometimes get questions where people are like, I don't, I only have so much space, what do I put in there? It's like, well, we've already talked, you kept me abreast on your newsletter, I already know X, Y, Z, so don't worry about weaving a mystery yarn. Like my old professor used to say, just answer the question, get to the point, but we don't forget all that we know when we go into the room, so build a relationship and just know that that, that, is, that is a factor. It's not everything, but it definitely comes into play, um, you know, just keeping us abreast of who you are and what you're doing. Good Kathy, what's the last word? Um, I think that you have all shared some really important things. And um, wow, that's a lot of pressure having having the last word. Let's just or say I'll, I'll, just I'll, chime I'll, in early. I know, I'll see you again. And I'll think of something with a lot of wisdom. I'm sort of distracted because so I keep thinking I see Prince Harry over here in the cold. <laughs> Thank you. 
Uh, I would echo uh, Jennifer's comments. Thank you all uh, for being here on the panel. Uh, and I, I would echo uh, the final comments here. We're all in this together. Do we, do we feel today like we agree we're all in this together? Does anybody still think you're out there on the island and you're the only one that has this challenge? <laughs> now, Brian, apparently you're royalty. <laughs> now, I do, I do want to qualify. Don't think that that means anything back at work. <laughs> but for today, the, what what you call it, Prince Harry? Prince Harry. Prince Harry. Okay. All right. We, 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 we'll we'll stay. We'll stay. We'll stay right here. I'm going to make no other comments. But yes, thank you all for being here. Paul, thank you for telling your story. At the end of the day, that story, I, I think, uh, well, I'll tell you really what shocked me. We were doing our research to bring Jennifer here to speak and the Power of the Possibility program. I'm online because whoever set it up here, Google, uh, I mean, without Google, where would we be? So, so anyway, with Google, I'm sitting there reading through this about board sources, focus, and program around collaboration, strategic alliances. And what did I find? But DPAA's story here locally was a case study in the curriculum. So I said, this has to be a song. Mm -hmm. so, so apparently, if we need to reach Jennifer. And thank you for being here and sharing your challenge and your message. Uh, I said it earlier this morning. Uh, we have to be the change. Uh, if we've made you think We've done our job. If you're leaving here saying, you know, maybe there's a different way, we've done our job. Uh, we are committed to the region. We're committed to our markets. Watch for the flyers. We'll be back next year. Uh, we will be conducting a survey. So we will be reaching out, asking for input. Because again, it's collaboration. So we want to hear from you. What can we provide back to you that's of value? that's strategic and at the end of the day moves the needle and helps all of those in the community you know and impacts lives because at the end of the day that's really what everybody in this group wants to do i've worked with your group folks like you for 30 years and i've never seen a more passionate group of people desperately trying to work themselves out of a job and you know, that sums it up for me. So thank you again for being here. Uh, we've enjoyed our time with you. Please come back. We do have some parting gifts. If I don't drop them. So thank you. Break any? Thank you. Vanna. Vanna will give one to uh, Jenny and, and again, thank you all for being here. Uh, please drive careful and enjoy the rest of your day and, and, and hopefully enjoy the weekend. I think it's supposed to be sunny, but it's supposed to be cold.